Welcome to Decades of Horror, the classic era. How can I do me dance without me legs? Can any of either one of you guys tell me? This is episode 165, recorded <laughs> November 26, 2023. Gruesome Magazine. My name is Jeff Moore, and I got both my legs, and I still can't dance. On this podcast, we cover the good, the bad, and maybe even the ugly horror films released since the beginning of time through 1969. In each episode, we'll discuss the monster spirit psychos and villains that have haunted movie-going audiences since the dawn of film history. With me this week are my incredible co-ghosts, Chad Hunt. Co-host on Decades of Horror, the all of them, film the producer, them. director with Wreak Havoc Productions, and a comic book artist and writer. How you doing, Chad? I am ready to go. Yeehaw! Let's do this, finally! Let's do it. <laughs> also with us is Doc Rotten. How rotten are we today, Doc? Oh, we're so rotten. We are so rotten. All right, well, unfortunately... <laughs> sit on this place is this has be been dry. a star cross episode we've rescheduled it three times and in the end we are not able to have daphne with us so sadly sadly we will miss her she's well, sitting at uh, home but, laughing going watch these three monkeys try to do this all i know time. watch them try to do it without me uh-huh. <laughs> i feel confident she will be your next episode uh decades of horror and gruesome magazine are partnering with play now media on several other channels and in fact Decades of Horror, the classic era, is on the classic sci-fi movie channel, the classic horror movie channel, and the Wicked Horror TV channel. E, yay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, check those out on your apps. You know, you can get them on Amazon TV, Fire TV, uh, I guess that's the same thing, Apple TV, Android TV, website, etc., etc., etc. So uh, you can get some stuff for free, or you can subscribe. But we're there. We are. Good stuff on there. And uh, spoiler alert, this movie, which is 64 years old, I think, 66 years old. If you haven't seen it, you should stop right now and go watch it. On this podcast, we start by giving some basic details of the film we are covering, followed by each of our first impressions of the movie, some taglines. And oh boy, does this movie have taglines. <laughs> and move on down the road from there with some talk, just some chatter about different stuff. It has to do with this movie. So our topic today is The Revenge of Frankenstein from 1958. Directed by Terrence Fisher, written by Jimmy Sankster. Additional dialogue from Herford Jane's. And also from, uh, I believe it's George Baxt, who was uncredited, but Herford James was actually credited. Uh, cast includes the one, the only, Peter Cushing, Francis Matthews, Eunice Gason, Michael Gwynn, John Welsh, Lionel Jeffries, Oscar Cretak, and Michael Ripper. And this is, of course, a Hammer film. Filmed at Bray Studios in England from January 6th to March 4th, 1958. It was released first, and I never can quite understand this, June 1st, 1958 in the U.S., August 27th, 1958 in the U.K. And the synopsis, having escaped execution and assumed an alias, Baron Frankenstein transplants his deformed underling's brain into a perfect body. But the effectiveness of the process and the secret of his identity soon begin to unravel. And I think I, I, I forgot, I'm, I'm not pronouncing that right, because frequently throughout the movie, they refer to Baron Frankenstein. Stein. Stein. Well, I think Peter uh, and Cushing this, himself says Stein. Yes, and, and also Stein. The, and the picture here is the uh, engraved letters on the coffin they dig up of Baron Frankenstein, who was supposedly beheaded at the guillotine. Missed it by that much. (laughs) Supposedly, yes. (laughs) Exactly. How evil do you have to be 
to substitute a priest for you in the guillotine. Mm -hmm. All right. I guess that was a spoiler, huh? Um, well, let's get right on to first impressions. And this is Doctor's Pick. And if you follow Decades of Horror, it's his... Well, it's actually his first one. This one will come out. And then he's also got a Hammer film pick for... Uh, his 70s episode will, that will come out a few days after this episode comes out. So That, that wasn't intentional. It just kind of happened. We understand. You just, you know, when, when you're under pressure, you just go hammer. I just go, ah, I got to find a film, hammer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Revenge of Frankenstein, of course, is the second in the Frankenstein series of films from Hammer, and this is where they decide to follow Baron Frankenstein instead of the monster, like Universal did. Uh, to uh, their credit and to the credit of Peter Cushing, who is a, uh, proves how great an actor he is with this film, uh, definitely. Um, this, is, this is a terrific entry into the series. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it, it, it definitely pushes the monster aspect of it aside. Uh, we do get a monster, but it's more, I don't know, it has a little bit more... Um, I, I don't know if emotions is the right word, but there's a lot more going on with this creature than just being sewed together and storming the countryside. There, there's there's something happening here. Um, it, it, well, I guess it kind of falls back on the old. Let's get the uh, let's, let's, let's get the, <laughs> the the hunchback helper and put him in a in a better body, right? Does that mm -hmm. thing? And we do that in right, the Hammer, right. in the Universal films yeah, as well. Yeah. Uh, but it does it to great effect. Um, it does have a great way of explaining how Baron Frankenstein did not die in the end of uh, The Curse of Frankenstein, which is terrific. Um, and what's interesting is this, this is the only, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the only film that directly follows the previous one. The other ones like loosely reference everybody and it becomes mm -hmm. this, right? But this one is most definitely a pick up where you left off sequel which, yeah, it's literally um, like he's walking out to the guillotine, and now he's yep. walking into the guillotine. Yeah, because it ended with the guillotine falling, and here we just find out it didn't fall on his neck. <laughs> it fell on somebody else. Uh, but he sets up as Stein in, an, in another part of the country, and not far enough, because <laughs> I knew who he was. Stein. And, um, but it, I don't know, it, it's... I, I miss having the, a monster in it, right? Because even though we have, you know, it follows Frankenstein, Baron Frankenstein, we usually get a, a form of a monster uh, of some sort. Uh, but it does. I guess Michael Quinn counts. But it's yeah. it's a little different. Um, in the end, I enjoy it. It's, it's a really good film. Uh, but it, it's... I don't know if you guys think this as well, but it's it's much different than other Hammer films in that respect i think i think it's far more serious far more into the story far more wealth well crafted um across the board um it you know they i i don't know i sound like i'm dissing like the rest of hammer but i'm not it's just this i think this is uh, one of their best efforts yeah 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 i agree i don't disagree Thank you for picking it, actually. Uh, Chad, how about you? What do you think of The Revenge of Frank Santa? When did you first see this? Um, I've seen this quite a few times over the years. I'm, 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 I'm thinking this is the first Frankenstein Hammer film I've seen or that I saw, ever saw, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, because I, it, I was confused about what was going on with them taking him to the gallows at the, at the beginning. But um, that, I love this film. I've, I've always loved it. And I loved it because the same reason that I kind of dig Hammer films, the Frankenstein ones anyway, is they always tried to be different or, or come up with some new angle each time that was uh, just diverged so far from what Universal was doing and, and the novel and everything like that, that uh, uh, it just made it made them interesting watches to me uh, uh, of where the, you know, where can we take this story? Where, what can we do with 
I mean, you, mm -hmm. you're watching movies that where Baron von Frankenstein is just an evil, an evil bastard, and he's not, <laughs> you know, in some of the Hammer Hammer movies, and and uh, he, I don't think he was originally meant to be that way, but Hammer took it took it that way, and and just ran with that and in some of these movies and it just was amazingly uh interesting to me but as this one was because i enjoyed uh i enjoyed the character of frankenstein um it got into a little bit of why, why he was doing what he was doing and and how he was moving from from town to town changing his identity and and that was all very to me it's cool when i was a little kid it wasn't so cool because I wanted to see monsters. There. Yeah, but, yeah. But now, yeah. as an this is like adult Frankenstein stuff. You know, it's uh, got into more um, uh, stuff like that. That just um, I don't think Universal ever would have thought to have done a Frankenstein movie this way. And you hate to always compare Hammer to Universal, but it, it, if you're a monster fan and a Frankenstein fan, you, it's it's an unavoidable. I think you can't help but, but do that. But I like where they took this. I like, uh, you know, Peter Cushing is a genius uh, and will always be in my eyes as far as acting goes because he he just knocked this out of the park as far as uh, playing this character. And um, I love the setting, um, the, the ancillary characters were, were really, really great. Um, and just an all around great movie. I mean, it, it's an hour and a half worth of just medical mayhem <laughs> you know basically and and that's what i liked about it and uh it's still one of my favorite hammer films uh to date it's just so well done that uh, i still love it today it's got Chekhov's tattoo in it uh, yes <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> I, I i i forgot to say that um yeah i i saw this movie a long long time ago i the frankenstein hammer films were I guess the most easily accessible that they seem mm -hmm. to play more often yeah. uh, growing up. Um, I, I'm trying to remember if, if it was Curse of Frankenstein or Frankenstein the Monster from Hell, which one I saw first. But one of those two I saw first. I did not see them in order. And you're right. You, um, what I was going after was when I saw this as a kid or a teen, it, it didn't really live up because I you wanted more creatures. Mm -hmm. You wanted something like that. Or, you know, something, yeah. something like uh, Frankenstein created woman would have worked but, and did when you were a teen. But, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, grow, and the more I watch this uh, with age dies, the more I appreciate this particular one and see it as the what it is today. Sorry, I just mm -hmm. wanted to jump in with that. Jeff, yeah. it's all you okay. yeah. Um Yeah, I... To be honest, I haven't. It wasn't that long ago when I saw it, and I liked this quite a bit. Um, yeah, it's different. You don't have the monster, monster, but it's it is much more nuanced. I think it's a it's a really good script. And uh, Chad mentioned Peter Cushing. He does a great job. He's a, he's a he's an evil he's an evil bastard in this one. <laughs> well, he, well, he is and he isn't. He's a right? psychopath. Well, yeah. I, th I but, think uh, I think driven is more. The, I've, yeah, I would say more, driven. Okay. I mean, but no, we don't but, care. Granted, there are some movies where he was evil. Well, what was it the um, Frankenstein must be destroyed? Is one where he's the most evil, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Right. Where he's kind of well, he's a he's, woman and everything. I think at at least he's a psychopath. He's a he has no problem using the poor and the destitute for experiments. You know, and, Never did. You know, I didn't have too much of a problem with it either. I mean, questions. How am I going to dance without me legs? That's all. Um, yeah. So well, and and uh, you know, we're going to have to take this arm. What? You're not taking my arm? Yeah, we are. Except scheduling. Okay. Look at this. Look at this cool arm I got. You know. Anyway. Um, yeah, I liked it a lot, and I like. There's a lot of cool uh, actors in this, or character actors that we'll talk about as we go through that that round out the cast that are frequent players in the hammer world. Uh, but I kind of like the whole development of the monster. Then I, I'm going to have to ask you guys about this. Maybe I'll just do this now. Um, so they were kind of hinting at, and this makes no sense to me. 
they were kind of hinting at when they transplanted the orangutan's brain into the chimpanzee, it turned him into a carnivore. Right? Did you catch that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, then they were worried that was going to happen to Carl. Carl. Yeah. Does that make sense? Well, wouldn't you be? Well, <laughs> huh? Wouldn't you be concerned? <laughs> well, well I, think, I think their concerns came to light, too. I don't think it was the same concern. I think it was a concern that the brain would, you know, take over the body, and that's what happened. Well, Are orangutans uh, carnivores? Well, that's just what I was wondering, because I kind of thought they were, but maybe not. Uh, nope. Mainly eat fruits, so yeah, that would have made sense. Small mammals, even small mammals. So, but, uh, so yeah, I guess that does make sense because I, I was thinking a orangutan was a uh, meat. Either that or it's just a device to uh, explain Carl's change in behavior, you know, yeah. later or something. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Yeah. So we have done, just, just to do a little history here, the history of the Frankenstein films and how many we've done of Hammer films on uh, decades of horror. The uh, films, the the, uh, the Hammer Frankenstein films are The Curse of Frankenstein, which we've done, The Revenge mm -hmm. of Frankenstein, which we're doing right now, The Evil of Frankenstein in 1964, Frankenstein Creates a Woman, 1967. Oh, you've done that one already? Uh... No, we haven't done that. I'm just listing okay. them off. Got it. We did The Curse and Revenge. That's all the ones we've done on this, on the classic era. Uh, so Revenge followed by The Evil, followed by Created Woman, followed by Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed, 1969. The Horror of Frankenstein, 1970. And Frankenstein <laughs> and the Monster from Hell, 1974, which we did on uh 70s so that three out of the seven we have covered on decades of course so far but then i got curious i kind of dug into the uh the main people here so terence fisher the director this is our the 10th decades of horror episode on a terence fisher film uh, wow. that includes uh 70s and classic era so um jimmy sangster the writer. This is the ninth Jimmy Sangster film in terms of films that he has written for. Cushing. Peter Cushing. I think I told you guys this, but this is the 26th Peter Cushing film we've done on <laughs> Decades of War. We, we don't like Peter Cushing at all, do we? We love him. Uh, he yeah. sucks. <laughs> oh, and there's so many more, too. I mean, holy cow. Uh, all right. So, that's just my uh, little history lesson there. But now it's time for Taglines <laughs> with Chad. All right, let's check these. I haven't looked at them yet, so let's see what's going on. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God, he says. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh Okay, I should have grabbed, grabbed a, a bottle of water before I came. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I think there's like 15 of them. Just so sit, sit back, folks. So. Yeah, watch watch Chad sweat sweat this one out. Okay, taglines for the Revenge of Frankenstein are as follows: The terror rises again. Okay, second tagline. <laughs> Sensational sequel to The Curse of Frankenstein, which smashed records throughout the world. That it did. Probably true, yeah. All right. Third one. Terror will seize you. Tension will squeeze you. Chills will freeze you. I like that one. That's a very, They like doing threes like that, don't that's they? That's a very 50s sci-fi one. That, yeah, it is. <laughs> throw it in there. Okay. Warning, warning, be sure you take this tremendous adventure in terror. Be sure you can take this tremendous adventure in terror. <laughs> what? <laughs> My eyes still aren't right yet. But pl please don't scream too loudly. <laughs> you may scare those waiting to get into the theater. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. 
in Supernatural Technicolor. Ooh, ooh, Supernatural. I like when they used to make up the different kinds of color. That was Mm -hmm. always kind of fun. (laughs) The whole world trembles before the new Frankenstein. The same old Frankenstein. Stein. Frankenstein is still the same. Frankenstein. (laughs) Frankenstein. Remember that the screams you hear will be your own. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) What was that hurt? Oh, that was me. Don't forget. (laughs) I'm sure this one had a picture to accompany it, but uh, this could be you after the Revenge of Frankenstein. New and greatest Frankenstein monster piece. Ooh, a monster piece. (laughs) We dare you to see it. We double dare you to forget it. (laughs) That doesn't sound like double dog dare you, and then you get your tongue stuck to the pole. (laughs) Just your tongue stuck to the monster. (laughs) If you go alone, you'll find yourself running all the way home. Get your tongue stuck to the pole. Oh my God. Will you? <laughs> um, that's lines. been <laughs> Taglines with Chad. Mm. Amazing Thank stuff. So. Thank Amazing. you so much. <laughs> it is. Well, you guys, you got anything you want to talk about before we get into posters and such? I want to see some posters because this has got some cool posters. It does. It does. All right. Well, here's here's. See, That's... Daphne, I'm over here by myself. Mm. I'm over here by myself. Yeah. Oh! Well, Dak keeps tickling you. He keeps reaching down and is that what massaging that is? your hair and stuff. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> it's a brain sucker starving to death. So here's the, uh, here's the, we see you, we dare you to see it, we double dare you, uh, new and greatest Frankenstein. I mean, sometimes they just can't get it supernatural. There's four taglines on this poster. <laughs> and the guy's face is always green, which green, never happens. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, where you know where they're you know where they're getting that from. Oh that's yeah, what, yeah. That's yeah. what they think. The Frankenstein monster, they think is green. Well, I guess people green, people but... won't come unless they know it's green. So you have to make him look a, more like a monster. Here's a couple of uh, lobby cards or reverse ones: uh, the Revenge of Frankenstein with Peter Cushion. And the bottom one is. I knew what this was when I. That's Spanish. That one's Spanish. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely has a 50s composition. Mm-hmm. Okay. Card so this whole. <laughs> yeah. This this whole. Is is a trend we'll see as we go through these posters. The, the hands. The hands. The hand, the the hand sticking down, and sometimes it's tickling the woman. You know, it's very strange. And once again, a woman that is not in the movie at the bottom of the French one and in the other. You know, so. See? First, See? I started at the feet. <laughs> tickle, tickle. Uh, another Spanish one. And he just, his eye is, he just looks really leering. Michael Gwynn get extra pay for this? I bet not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Italian, a little different, kind of fun. Nasty La Vendetta di Frankenstein. La Vendetta. La Vendetta. How come nobody tried to say the, the, the Spanish? La Revanche uh, de Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Okay. La Revanche de Frankenstein. And here we go with German. Frankenstein's Rach. Who's the That's, person behind uh, him? <laughs> revenge, yeah, I, I don't know. And the guillotine ready to, I don't know, slice through that guy's body, I guess. Man, look at those fingers. I know. That almost looks like a detached hand. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, it doesn't, mm. okay. Yeah, it's attached. <laughs> and then we have a couple of these that I just kind of like the... Uh, Peachy Border, Screen's Greatest Scream Fest, got the, super the Revenge of Frankenstein. Of oh, wow. Yeah. And look look at it again. His finger's like... They gave him red fingernails on the bottom. Poker eye out or something <laughs> there. I don't know. Looks like Gene Simmons. 
Um, (laughs) And still green, and still green. And finally, a couple of DVD covers, which are similar in color design, but... Where did the top one come from? I saw that on a DVD box once. It says DVD in a box. They both say DVD, and I've... uh, Vinganka de Frankenstein. I th- I did look that up, but I don't remember what language that was. But I mean, that picture isn't from the movie, is it? Did, we, is that, did I miss that? I guess it is from the movie, isn't it? Um, is, that, is that when they're putting him back? I guess it is. Because it looks like the guy. Looks yeah, like him. Yeah. This one looks like he's he's. Oh yeah, that, that's his glass box. So okay. So I didn't. I, you know, I didn't put together any slides for uh, Terrence Fisher and Jimmy Sanctor because we talk about them so much. Um, they're just dominant, but I am going to take a minute to talk about the writing. So I'm going to pull that card up again. So in the, the, uh, maybe I've got it here someplace else that I can pretend like I know what I'm talking about here. Um, okay. The, uh, when you're watching a movie, the writing credit says, I think, Screen, screenplay by Jimmy Sangster and additional dialogue by Herford James. Now, in the trivia or details about this movie in a couple places on the internet, I saw that uh, Jimmy Sangster wrote the novelization of this movie in 1958 under the name Herford James. And then I looked in the internet speculative fiction database where you can look up all kinds of horror and science fiction and fantasy writers. And if you look up Jane, uh, Herford James, it says alternative name for Jimmy Sangster. But yet on the, if you, um, on the commentary for the Blu-ray that I have, which I believe is Steve Haberman, he describes them as, and, and maybe Constantine Nasser, I think it's a couple of them, he describes them as a British novelist. So I started trying to dig into this and uh, I contacted our uh, frequent commenter and uh, uh, rabbit hole explorer, <laughs> Jerry. Wow. 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 Uh, yeah, I didn't say it, Jerry. I didn't say it this time. <laughs> so I talked to Jerry Here's and he's funny. like, oh, no. Um, rabbit. So he gave me this big long thing about how he had tried to search it out and he had gone to a conference like quite a while ago and uh, on one of the panels somebody had asked this question and the panel were like arguing about it you know whether this was him or not so Jerry basically said you know it seems like maybe it's him maybe it could be him maybe it's on IMDB it says George Baxt did additional dialogue it was uncredited so maybe it's george baxt i ha- i can't for the life of me figure out if jimmy sangster wrote the screenplay and then provided additional dialogue why they would put it under another name you know why would you why would you just not leave it as jimmy sangster uh so finally i reached out to dick clemenson and he responded the uh you know publisher owner editor of little shop of horrors magazine the journal of british horror Films and he said that George Bax told him that there was a Herford James. It was not Jimmy Sangster, mm. but it still is very odd because the guy has. I think he has no other credits in IMDb, and uh, they just seems like an odd person choice to do that. And did Herford James write the novelization? Who wrote that? I don't know. It's confusing as hell. But I'm I'm taking. Uh, Dick Clemenson's word for it. You guys have anything to say about it? It's... No. Nope. <laughs> I just took it at, at face value. I didn't know. Well, he does have he does have three credits. He got Revenge of Frankenstein and then London Playhouse and ITV Play of the Week. So like two TV things. But right, his, right, right, but right. His, but his birthday is entirely different. It's uh, right. 1909 to 2000. And we're saying Jamie Sangster, right? Who has nineteen twenty seven to two thousand eleven? So, right, it le- that that leans toward two different people entirely. Yeah. So how did how did this information get put into all these internet databases that they're the same person and and then would you? It's it's just 
bizarre. We this is like for some reason this is a year for us doing this, mm. where stuff comes up that it says this, and then somebody else says, "Well, no, that's not it." Um. Anyway, well, the and internet then we find out lie. Yeah, no. Well, I have no doubt, and what it tells me is how many people use the internet as their source, as a cross source for their information. So, once it ends up in IMDb as a detail or even on Wikipedia, then it's going to get cross-referenced everywhere, even even though there may not be a source for it. All right, enough about the writers. Let's talk about the Kush. Get a cushion! And that top picture is the opening scene where he's being... The other one, I, if I remember right, the other uh, Curse of Frankenstein ends with him being led away off to the guillotine, right? And mm-hmm. then that, yeah, it ends with the By guillotine this. dropping, but you don't see. Right, right. You don't see anything. Um, and in this one, we get the same scene over again with the guillotine drops, and you hear some like. <laughs> you're shuffling <laughs> like, around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're something going on, like. <laughs> uh, and and, friend, and Peter Cushing gives the. Uh, the what, what's, it, what's the name of the people that dropped the. My brain's farting. But the the guy that's going to drop the guillotine. The executioner. Little, yeah, the executioner yeah. gives him a little wink. And then, gives him the side eye. Yep, yeah, they little nod, and off they go. We're going to kill this little Disney-looking <laughs> priest here. It looks like he belongs in a Disney movie. Well, and then when the, the two guys decide to go, they're getting paid. This, all this, uh, there's a lot of little touches in here that I just love. These two guys, um, might as well pop them up here quick. Michael Ripper and Lionel Jeffries are great in this. Uh, Lionel Jeffries is like the Tom Sawyer that gets people to do his work for him. And um, and apparently he even lies to him because he, Michael Ripper says, I ain't going to do it for three marks. And he goes, well, we could get 10 marks and we could split it. And then you, you realize that Lionel Jeffries knew all along he was going to get 10 marks, but he lied to Michael Ripper so he could keep seven and only give three mm-hmm. to Michael Ripper. So... Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're hilarious. They go out there and dig up that grave, and um, he's <laughs> Lionel Jeffries is just this odd, angular play. Uh, but he's 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 been in a bunch of stuff. Um, anybody have any ideas where we might have seen him? Oh no, I never even think about it. What, what is well, it? Well, I think he's in one of your favorite movies. Aren't you a big Chitty Chitty Bang Bang? Ah, is he in the TJ Bang Bang? <laughs> I think he is. Uh, um, it's, it's been decades since I've seen that movie. Oh, uh, yeah. Been a while. Well, he's one of those guys, at, at, at least for me, he's one of those guys that I always recognize. Um, <laughs> Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Uh, he played Grandpa Potts in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, yeah. And he was in some... Hammer films, I'm almost sure. Some of this stuff I thought I wrote out, but apparently I didn't add it to the notes. If we'd have done this when we originally scheduled it, I would have remembered it. Ah, nice. No doubt. Well, he was the first Men in the Moon he was in, uh, which isn't a Hammer film, is it? I don't think that's a Hammer film. Right, right. This Fantastic Flying Fools is another movie. That's fun. A spy with a cold nose? What is that? Is that a dog movie? <laughs> Must be. <laughs> um, well, maybe, you know, uh, did an episode of The Adventures of Robin. Maybe he didn't do. I was almost sure he'd done some Hammer films, but maybe not. Maybe. Oh, Quatermass Experiment. Oh, he's in that? Okay. Yep. Oh, that's before. Before this, yeah. Yeah, that's 55. Um, so, anyway. This is a, a, a guy that's recognizable to me and uh, has done, I don't know, he's got a bajillion credits. Hundred, well, not that many, 114. He's got 114 credits. That's, that's decent. Just, that's just a decent shy career. of a bajillion. Just shy, yeah. Um, so, and we know Michael Ripper. Uh, Michael Ripper! And I'm thinking, is this his first, I think this is first... Hammer film. Oh no, 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 no. He was in. He was in um, 
Uh, uh, first Hammer it? horror film. He How's that? A, well, I guess if you want to call the sci-fi ones, yeah. Because he was in like one of the X movies. Which one was it? Um, and I. Uh, oh, he yeah, he was in uh, X the Unknown. Right. Well, I guess I would call that horror, so I, I don't know. That's kind of a lame statistic. Previously, previously appeared in several of the studios non-horror. That, that's kind of a... Yeah. Yeah, I guess, that, I mean, that, that one is more sci-fi, but it gets grouped into horror stuff often because... We, we get skeletons and skeletons stuff. and stuff. Stuff. So what do you to... think of these two guys? Oh, I love them, man. I like that Michael Ripper runs off. I got, I got to meet Michael Ripper... At a, a oh, convention, cool. at a convention in, um, I think it was in Pennsylvania. Inger Pitt was there as well. She was a darling. Um, I think he, he was, he, oh, was wow. he was quite old at this time, but he was, they, they had a whole, um, special event with him coming out and all the people that knew him. It was kind of like a, this is your life event for him. And everybody was yelling, Michael Ripper, because <laughs> everybody loved him. Um. But yeah, he was he was he was wonderful to talk to. Really was. Yeah. And I was sometimes. Are these these two guys were kind of a highlight for me. Um, All righty. Uh, well, let's get back to uh, Cushing. Um, so they these two guys dug up Cushing or dug up Baron Frankenstein's grave and and go basically. Well, I mean, it's a priest, you know. <laughs> what do we do when Michael Ripper runs away? He takes off. He's, I'm out of here. <laughs> Lionel Jeffries goes, hmm, I could get all ten marks myself. And then uh, Dr. Stein shows up out of the shadows. And uh, Lionel Jeffries has a heart attack and falls in. Oh, that's right. He just, he just has a heart attack, doesn't he? <laughs> but now it's interesting because... Uh, when they dig up the, they show, uh, I think they show Frankenstein and his henchman, uh, Carl, filling in the grave or patting down the dirt. But then when the cops come and, or, or the, uh, <clears throat> the medical board come and dig it up, there's nobody in there. So there was a, there was a, some information I read where they, the, the uh, uh, British Board of Film Classification said, you can't bury that guy alive. So, okay. You know, even though he falls into the grave and we're showed filling it up, when they open the grave up again, now there's nobody in there. So I guess we didn't bury him. I, I, I don't know. We drug him off. <laughs> Threw him in the bushes. What do you think of those <laughs> two characters, Chad? <laughs> oh, I loved them. I thought they were funny. And, um, you know, like Doc said, everybody loves Michael Ripper. So, um yeah, they were just funny, funny, funny brain. And that's what horror kind of needs that, you know. It, it can be as serious as a heart attack, uh, no pun intended. Uh, but um, having these two guys in there made it reminiscent of some of the older Universal stuff with the old, the, the lady who used to, oh, my goodness, he's all eating away. You know, that, he's that lady. He's all eating away. Um, so yeah these guys were hilarious i thought and uh probably were guys just like this creeping around uh back at that time so yeah it was good i liked it um yeah i think they're great and cushing or uh, ripper half the time you can't tell uh what they're doing so we saw cushing and then these are him being uh sort of quizzical or wondering, trying to figure something out, and then being stern, and you know, he's gonna, he's just, he's just so great. Who's the superhero up at the top? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it must be uh, <laughs> Death Man. Yeah, <laughs> Choppy Chop Man. Choppy Chop Man, and then some more Cushing. This is after he gets beat up. By the patients <laughs> mm -hmm. in the poor ward, and that was pretty good makeup, I thought. Yeah, it, it really, was to me. It really looked like his cheek was cut open and swelled up. And nobody's going to recognize him with that mustache at the bottom. Nobody. That's right. No, no, it's like like glass. And with the new name, Doctor Frank. <laughs> yeah, Doctor Frank. <laughs> Frank. 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 
He starts talking going like, for uh, the old woman with the daughter again. Yeah. He what starts a, talking a, like Vincent Price now. Yeah. But what a great scene that was when he comes out. Yes, it was. Like, <laughs> he's got a little telltale sniffing a flower. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he's but he's already got his mannerism. He does mm-hmm. the, the, the old mustache. Smoothing move. I thought he was great in this. He was. Yeah, absolutely. Great. He was. It'll be interesting now to to watch Evil of Frankenstein again to see how it bleeds from this movie into that one or if it even tries. Oh yeah. I may have to do that. I think I, I think I have them all. I just haven't ever watched them in order. Um so yeah, so the person that he well, I was gonna say tricks into helping him, but He's a pretty willing tricker, a willing Tricky? participant yes. in this stuff. <laughs> Tricky. Dr. Cleva, uh, Francis Matthews. Yes. Uh, another guy with some uh, cred. He was in, uh, so this is interesting. He killed Christopher Lee in both Dracula, Prince of Darkness, and Rasputin, the Mad Monk. <laughs> he did indeed. And if same, I remember same right, year, Chad, same year. <laughs> yeah, well, I think they shot them back to back in the same location. Oh, wow. That's a so day. That's a day's work. That they used in the same, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, they finished one up and then started the other one. He played, and then Suzanne, Susan Farmer's husband in Dracula, Prince of Darkness, and her brother in Rasputin, the Mad Monks. So right there, we got three different people that are in both those movies. And in 75, he is awarded a silver goblet by Italy for being the country's second most popular actor. Mm. That's kind of interesting. And he was in uh, Corridors of Blood in 1958 with Boris Karloff. He's here. He's, he does a decent job. Yeah. Oh, I like him quite a bit. He's, he's, he plays the part. Exactly as it needs to be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A well, willing, in fact, he's willing volunteer. Yep. I'm kind of wondering if he's learning uh, from Peter Cushing because you know how Peter Cushing's always got some little thing he's doing. You know, mm-hmm. well, this guy does that a lot. You know, when the uh, <laughs> the guy they call the up patient comes in and is talking to him, you don't. I almost don't pay any attention to him because this guy's over here. Doctor Cleva is over here wiping off his scalpels and scissors and you know uh he gets into that too yeah peter cushion loved props yeah he does he does uh so here he is in those uh movies i believe i got some shots there's in rasputin the mad monk in the top picture with christopher lee and with barbara shelley in dracula prince of darkness and with Boris Karloff, Corridors of Blood. Corridors of Blood. Looking like he stepped I'm right thinking, out of this movie into that one. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I yeah, I'm, I'm thinking Corridors. Is it is it that the one where uh, Karloff is a doctor and he's working on uh, anesthesia, and then he gets hooked on it? And I think Christopher Lee is in that. And he plays like a, a guy that coordinates grave robbers. He's got a really weird name, too. I can never think of it. Resurrection like Joe. Yes, that's yes. it. Resurrection Joe. He almost, yeah. That, that, that's a fun movie. It's, it's The horror is in the, uh, you know, the thinking of what's happening. I don't remember it being particularly... gory or, or, or uh, action-packed or anything. It was it was uh, supposed to be the uh, tops and tear. <laughs> of course. Oh, a tagline there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, he, he does pretty good. I like the, the little bits he does. And uh, uh, at the end, you know, when he's fixing up Peter Cushing or Dr. Stein after he's been beat up, uh, and they realize that they're they're coming for him, you know what to do. And so, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm still not exactly sure what it was he was doing. Um, he, 
what was the what whose brain was that that he took and put in the jar wasn't it the um guy with the arm because they showed the tattoo well they took the arm off so he stitched they took the arm and put it on i i didn't understand how that uh, unless it was because because uh dr frank looked exactly the same as dr stein (laughs) Well, I think Except they were implying the that. I think they were implying he took on the features once they put the brain in there, but you know. Ah, oh, there you go. But okay. uh, well, I guess it's a stretch. It's happened. a stretch. All right. All right. Well, at least this time we can bury Doctor Stein in the grave of Doctor Frankenstein. <laughs> All right. Well, Eunice Gason, I don't know. <laughs> What do you think of this part and uh, what she, she was doing? She's incredibly annoying, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I, I don't know. There's just something about her I just found annoying. Um, She's a little too she innocent, with you. isn't she? <laughs> yeah, and it, didn't, and it didn't fly with me. I, she specifically went places she wasn't supposed to go to, and they asked her not to go, and like I can't remember what the other guy that was in the the hospital, the the helper guy that she asked to take down to see Carl. Um, you want to see something really scary? That yeah, patient? yeah. That that guy's name was Up Patient because up-patient? he was the only one that was up walking around. Yeah. Oh, the okay. Yeah. That, was, um, that was the credit for him. Okay. I don't know. I, I guess they needed her to do that to, to, to tell the story they were telling, but it didn't. I don't know. It, it didn't seem to me like she would have had so much uh, interest in uh, a patient like that. I don't know. I don't know. She, she seemed like a, uh, a, a <laughs> bleeding heart liberal with misplaced intentions, you know, mm. and they kind of spelled it out for her. I got, my father, the was her father, the priest or whoever it was, would ordered them to let her come to the hospital and distribute. I, I can't remember what it was: biscuits and cigarettes, and or biscuits and tobacco, and something else to the yep. to the yeah. uh, patients. And like, oh, that will make like that'll help them a little bit while they're there. But it's sort of like all the comforts of home. So, yeah. She just didn't quite <laughs> get it. Yeah, she come off as kind of, and I'm sure she's a very smart lady, very beautiful lady, but they, she came off as kind of dumb and annoying. Uh, like she had no clue, I guess, about what was going on when she, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that I, I'm totally with you. She came from a, they looked at her as being totally silly and naive and, you know. Troublemaker. Uh, she did. Uh, <laughs> Eunice Gase Gason did uh, some interesting stuff. She had. She was in Doctor No and from Russia with Love. Sylvia Trench. Hmm. And did the standard British television series. She did an episode of Secret Agent, a couple episodes of The Saint, and an episode of The Avengers. And was kind of done by 1972. <laughs> she went from one bond to another before he was bond. Um, right? Cause in the Saint uh, Roger Moore? Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did I confuse you a little bit with that offhand remark? All right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> she is officially the very first actress to play a bond girl. Mm. Hmm. She was she's originally got that cast quality. as Miss she's... Money Penny, but then that part went to somebody else. So anyway, she does have that Bond girl quality, especially in the sixties. Yeah. yeah. So I don't see anything in particular about why she left the business, but you know, not an uncommon. Nope. Seventy-two is all said and done, wasn't it? Now, so we've kind of been talking a little bit about the up patient. Who is played by uh, Richard Wordsworth? And I thought he was great. Um, I loved him. So 
There he is in this movie in the top picture. But he was also in the Quatermass Experiment. Oh, that's my favorite. Is that, is, that, that, is that him, the skinny one? In the... That, that's him sitting down. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I never would have. Put and that the bottom picture is he is the, uh, I don't know what you'd call him, the bum that rapes uh, Oliver Reed's mother in The Curse of the Werewolf. Mm. Hmm. Fun. Look at Brian Dunleavy, the best quater mask whatever done did. <laughs> you say that. You do. Yeah, I think I got that right. Yeah, he's the beggar that impregnates Oliver's mother and Curse of the Werewolf. And then in the quater mask experiment, he's the kind of the creation of some of their experiments there. So, Well, he's the guy that comes back from he's outer a, space a, with the, uh, he turns into the big yeah, yeah, yeah. blob thing. So I thought I loved him. He was just, he was like stealing. He was a steam scene stealer. I thought everywhere he yeah. went, he was yucking oh, it up and making cracks. Yeah, he, he was. I, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I really enjoyed him every time he was on screen. You want to go see the special patient? Yeah. <laughs> he seemed to be a, a little bit more of a. Uh, what he, he was a troublemaker too, wasn't he? Yeah, <laughs> he yes. Caused mm -hmm. as much trouble as possible. Gossiper, troublemaker. I want to know what he's got in that uh, Dixie cup there. <laughs> well, he's always trying to get an extra something out, you know. Probably got a little kick to it, he, right? <laughs> he gets a tobacco from her, then she takes a little more tobacco, and then uh, Dr. Cleva offers him a drink. And then when Dr. Cleva leaves, he goes, Well, mind if I have another? And, uh, oh, well, thank you. As he walks out and never says anything, <laughs> he's got 190 or, uh, yeah, 190 credits. Wow. So, That's what you working. Character actor. Yes. So this guy too, I thought these, all these guys were great, added a lot to it. Uh, this is George Woodbridge. The guy who's going to beat up. Carl slash Michael Gwynn version of Carl. Oh, he's the oh he's the the tenant guy, right? So yeah, he's like a something landlord like or janitor yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah, landlord janitor. Yeah, he, he gets, and he, he just he's... is going to go beat the crap out of him until suddenly the rage emerges. The one thing he wasn't supposed to do, he did. Right, right. We're we going to talk about Michael Gwynn. Yes, we are. I just want to throw this small part in here. Um, so we have Carl, who's kind of two guys. So the top one is Oscar Quitak, and the bottom one is Michael Gwynn. All right. And in the credits, Oscar Quitak is billed as the dwarf. <laughs> He's more of a hunchback, though, isn't he? Well, he is a hunchback. And so here we are again. I don't know. This is like the third or fourth hunchback movie we've done in the last couple of months it seems like um so here's uh at the beginning michael gwynn after his change and then the, the top picture and then the bottom you can see his scar on his forehead in the bottom picture he's kind of starting to drool mm -hmm. and then you have these two iconic pictures that you see everywhere mm -hmm. uh when he comes back in to the uh it's, it's a bar right isn't it that he come crash or the no it's the uh party that he crashes into yeah yeah after his body starts going back to its original which right. car, what carl's body looked like yeah, yeah it was weird right but we, we've seen a number of frankenstein movies take this approach mm -hmm. um especially in the 70s when they started trying to do you know, just like the Frankenstein book, right? And they, you know, you would see. Yeah, the one with Michael Sarazen. Yeah, the true story. Out, yeah, yeah, it started out all beautiful, pretty, and, and then start mm -hmm. to decay. And that's what they yeah. do here, in mm -hmm. a way. Looks like uh, Vern, uh, Ernest, 
<laughs> the bottom there. Hey, Vern, guess what? I switched brains with that other fella. <laughs> so he's, a, he's got quite the history, too, doesn't he? He does. He does. A few films I think you like. Village of the Damned. Yes. Uh, also, Jason and the Argonauts, which I have promised Bill if we ever do that one. Oh, Lord, he was in uh, Faulty Towers. Really? Lord Melbury. I say. Now I'll have to watch Faulty Towers again. He's in Scars of Dracula. Yep. He has a very, uh, I mean, I know there's makeup, but that's a very, a lot of that is him and his, and his hair. But, man, that's gruesome looking. Mm-hmm. But he does a good job. You know, He's she comes and talks to him. And I'll, I think it's uh, Dr. Kleba, the uh, Francis Matthews, that tells him that, oh, yes, scientists are going to be very interested in you. They're all going to want to come and talk to you. Oh, I, I thought mm-hmm. I was going to. My whole goal was to quit getting people to stare at me. Yeah. And so that's why he sneaks out. He Seems like that's something that... they would have talked about beforehand, though. <laughs> would they? Uh, would they? <laughs> but uh, I, he wasn't supposed to tell him that. I gathered from what Dr. Frankenstein, when he found out that yeah. the other guy told him all this stuff, he was like, you Dr. stupid Stein, idiot. It's like, Yes. You fool, don't you ever take into account human nature? Yeah, like you could have realized that somebody might say something they shouldn't have if you didn't warn them. Uh, yeah, so he does, he's, he's good at metamorphosizing. So uh, we have these kind of cool experimental things too. Uh, we got the fish tanks, I called them. God, I was laughing so hard. Oh my God. The eyeballs. <laughs> Don't move uh, like that. Well, it's uh, funny because he... <laughs> then they're uh, looking Peter around Cushing, like, what are you doing? Over here? Peter Cushing hides lighting the match and the burner from them so they can't see it ahead of yeah. time. And then... Puts it near the hand and it's like... And then the hand is coming up. I thought... I don't know why I thought I had... Oh, and then, you know... But so there was... There was then there's the brains and there was two scenes where they're dumping brains into these glass jars for full of some solution. Saline. Other than that, not much gore. He does, uh, kills that girl who can't get her boyfriend to make a move. She just gets done. Uh-huh. <laughs> what does All she right. say to him? Yeah, he was it. like, look at the ants or something he was saying. And she's like, are we going to sit here all night or are you going to do something? Or... Well, you do see the amputated arm because that's the one that has... We do, and I thought yeah, I, has I had a tattoo it, on it. I don't, I don't see it now. Um, yeah, because it's the tattoo giveaway that's on that arm. Yeah. The tattoo They did, they did this a lot in the Hammer films. They showed the Yeah, because the, the, the arm has the tattoo on it. And then yeah. at the end, he when he's washing up, you see the tattoo on his arm. Mm-hmm. Before he goes. Very interesting. <laughs> so that whole contraption that they had when they were trying to energize the uh, the new creature, I guess. Yeah, he's got to um, run. He's got to run around the office. He's got to. Yeah, he, he has to walk around and do a bunch of different switches. <laughs> this one over here, I I flip the switch over here. I got to slide the thing into the hole and over here i gotta crank it a little bit and back over here and now i'm throwing another lever switch and, yep. and it all works he knew what he's doing it's, it's part of the mad scientist look <laughs> you gotta you gotta run around looking crazed while you yep. turn things on and some of them got a spin and some of them got a spark or something i don't know what was in that one box that was humming and glowing you know it looked like it had like six jars in it or something or you know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Science. I, I don't know what that was. <laughs> Got it down at Acme Supply. Yeah, yeah, this thing. <laughs> oh, look at that. It just hummed. He flipped the switch and it started humming and glowing. That's, I don't know. That's energy from somewhere. Um, Firefly energy. So what, any... 
Fireflies. City <laughs> people. Firefly energy. You got that right. Uh, oh, here we go. Do what? what do we, here we go. What? 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 He's teasing us. Yeah, I am. Oh, I found the. I think I found the arm. So. Oh, all right. There it is. But yeah, I guess it is light on the, on the effects, but it it delivers when it needs to. Mm -hmm. You get the eyeballs and the brains, the icky stuff, and. But like I said, this is this is a for it, it, it has a maturity that is not always present in these films. Yeah, <laughs> you know it's a I mean? deeper because they're usually deeper story kind of, and more characters. I think, yeah. yeah, yeah. Not not to be belittle the other films, but they tend to be more. Directly yeah, toward, I get you. Yeah, it's it's. Mm -hmm. And when I that's like when I said it felt 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 like an adult. Mm -hmm. Frankenstein movie, more of an adult, uh, mature, I guess you said, like you said. Especially when you mm -hmm. compare it to like Frankenstein, the Monster of the Mail or something. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> I'm still trying yeah. to figure that one out. No, oh, I love that movie. It's, it's such a what's disaster. that? It's a disaster piece. It is Frankenstein <laughs> and the Monster from Hell. The uh, this had a lot of the standard Hammer crew with it. Right. So uh, besides Terrence Fisher and Jimmy Sangster, we also had, uh, let's see, well, Michael, Michael Carreras, Anthony Nelson Keys, Anthony Hines were the producers. Cinematography of Jack Asher, editing Alfred Cox, production design Bernard Robinson and makeup department Phil Leakey, who were the, the ones uh, that, that started and all those. So. You know, this was the the crew that had worked together on Curse of Frankenstein and Horror of Dracula. Dracula. <laughs> it was released in the U.S. on a double bill with Curse of the Demon. Oh, which would have been a hell of a hell of a. I was going to say feature. that that that'd be a fun double feature, wouldn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, it would. All right. Anything else? Anybody wants to mention? I think that's it. Now we just need to. Schedule uh, the evil of Frankenstein and see yeah, yeah. how it continues. A variety called this a high-grade <laughs> horror film with rich production values. Motion Picture Daily said a horror picture turned out with creative skill and imagination. Harrison's reports declared it a first-rate picture of its kind. The monthly film Vulcan, Vulcan said a contrived plot and a notable lack of pace and imagination. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> so... Yeah, you can never make everybody happy, but that's, you know. So anyway, yeah, I guess that's it for uh, The Revenge of Frankenstein. I like this quite a bit. And I so think did it's I. neat how they, how they, like, literally, it's like a direct sequel mm -hmm. starting with the same scene. And they were but, clever in the way that they continued it. I mean, you thought he was dead at the, at the end of the first one, and they figured out a pretty gruesome and gory way to get him out of it, you know. To continue well, it was, it's interesting too because they don't show this the actual killing or the body in the first one, mm -hmm. but they, I, if they had the intent, because because uh, I think this was a case where they like sold it, sold the whole thing in a in a almost a poster beforehand, you know, mm -hmm. and Jimmy Sangster's like, yeah, but I killed him. Well, find a way not to, to yeah, <laughs> unkill him, unkill him. Resurrection journey. All right. Be Marvel before Marvel even existed. Yeah, yeah. Well, we do have some feedback. Shall we move on to that? Let's do feedback. Letters. Uh, we read our, your letters. I gotta, I gotta come up with a little logo for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Um, first one's on episode one hundred and fifty. Rosemary's baby from C W D Kidman. 2266. Anybody who wants to read that? I can, I can do it. It looks pretty okay, long. Okie dokie. No, I'll do it. All right. So, uh, CWD Kidman 2266 said, Look at Mia Farrow, 1967, and imagine her lifting a big budget Hollywood horror movie onto her shoulders and carrying it across the finish line to box office gold. And she does. This frail little woman, with a lot of help from Roman Polanski, lifted this movie, this big movie, onto her bird-like shoulders and charged <laughs> into superstardom. I don't know if that's a compliment or not, but I hope it is. 
Um, well, it, it 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 actually the the way that he he or she's the way they state that is pretty. It is pretty impressive, right? Oh yeah, definitely, just definitely. Uh, remember a follow up, John and Mary. <laughs> Hollywood grabbed the two hottest stars, Mia and Dustin Hoffman, and put them in a love story, which bombed. I haven't seen it, and it's forgotten today. But it uh, was a, a greatly promoted as the pairing of young Burton Taylor movie. And who knows? Maybe it's a lost classic, like Who's Minding the Men? Oh man, Who's Minding the Men? I remember that movie. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Hill would probably side with her in a second if she claimed spousal abuse. <laughs> but really, <laughs> listen to what Rosemary does tell him. And remember that Dr. Uh, Saperstein is a, is a new top OBGYN. He new York her, top OBGYN. I think I left the word out there. But oh, yeah. New York? Okay. Um, he, does, he does her a favor from his point of view by not putting her in Bellevue. All right. Got yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's easy to picture a guy making a deal with his neighbors as a joke right up until Roman C. tells him that if he uh, tries to back out, he and Rosemary uh, would both leap to their dooms. Hmm. Kind of a catch-22 there, right? Yeah, he's stuck, uh... boy. Prior to this meeting, his neighbors, uh, he is very loving. He agrees to the apartment he can't not really afford. He tolerates Rosemary giving his resume at the slightest opportunity, and on the day of his biggest disappointment, he doesn't act grouchy but dejected. Uh, and a normal person would ask, what if I get a break on my own? And Roman says to bring him a personal possession of his rival, and his rival will go blind the next day. And Guy kindly does it. Kiddingly, not kindly, but kiddingly does it. And Donald goes blind. Then the guy thinks, holy crap, he can do this. And from then on, Guy is not evil, but terrified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pretty so. Good way of looking at that, yeah. Yeah, so. good comment. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Mia Farrow, that was, uh, it's, uh, it's an incredible movie if you look at all the people that were combined in it, you know, mm -hmm. and it was, I think it was the first film that Polanski did where he uh, wrote the screenplay from a novel and uh, he wasn't real sure how to do that and Mia Farrow was even though this character was sort of timid and uh, scared uh, Mia Farrow did it perfectly oh yeah a lot, a lot of things went right with that movie mm-hmm Appreciate it. So now, uh, Chad, we have a few on episode 164, The Head. From Mikey Z. Mikey Z says, by the way, Jeff, Johnny Staccato, he's got it's Staccato. Yeah, it's, it's, staccato yeah, it's, was uh, the TV show with John Cassavetes you were thinking about. It is. I was mentioning the jazz music, and it reminded me of a couple TV shows from the late 50s, and that was... Mm -hmm. I, I could only think of Johnny something or another, so appreciate it there, yeah. Mikey. Chad, sorry for you having to sit through a film you didn't like, and Bergman references to boot. I'm used to it by now, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 they do it to me on purpose now, so, you know, I just roll with the flow. So, Doc, what about Ralph Miller? So, remember, uh, the German title is Die Nachte und mm, der Satan. Yeah, Ralph Miller goes, kiddingly, I suppose, a nude woman and Satan, count me in. I knew he was going to like that. <laughs> Thanks, Ralph. <laughs> well, and, uh, Mike, I love it when our uh, listeners start a chat between each other. Mikey Z replied, better than a woman and a nude Satan. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, probably. Where's Tellers uh, of when you need them? <laughs> the last, <laughs> the last comment of uh, for this episode is also on one sixty four. <laughs> the hit Gregory Crosby three three two five. Uh, where are we at, Chad? I think. Okay. I've been down for the last few days with strep throat, so I had ample time to watch the head before I listened to this episode. And what can one say except thanks, Daphne, 
thanks. Mm-hmm. How <laughs> does he mean that? I don't know how he means yeah, that. How do you, how, how does that oh, I say? think he. I think he means thanks, Daphne. Thanks. Is, it, is, is there oh, okay. sarcasm in there? Do you color with sarcasm? All right. I could have uh, read that in a couple of different ways. I just wasn't sure what his meaning was. Well, it's clear he, that he, in. <laughs> go ahead. Go on, and you'll you'll see. <laughs> okay, it's clear that in the subgenre of living severed head brain in a jar films. This one goes to the bottom of the class, oh, and I suspect no. <laughs> that it does indeed play better in the original German. But if there were any number of fun moments, I, pra- or, uh, I particularly liked how after waking up three months later from major surgery, Irene is immediately offered a cigarette. Ah, 1959. <laughs> I did too, man. I was like, <laughs> and he's jer- she's jerking all around and everything after he just said, don't do that. Don't you shouldn't have any sudden movements as she starts going gah, 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 and tries to get away from. Him. I also loved how the tired trope of the hero desperately trying to convince the police that something's wrong is deftly dismissed. You're Judge Lerner's son? Well, why didn't you say so? Points for that one. Also, I'm fairly certain Irene wasn't a nun. That's just a traditional German nurse's uniform. But I can't confirm this as the Wikipedia entry for the head has no plot synopsis. Hmm. Even the army of wiki nerds could not be bothered. Well, now the, the, the other side of that is <laughs> the uh, in the German credits, it said Schweitzer, it said Sister Irene for who that uh, actress was playing. So that's why we assumed it was a nun. I oh, guess. Yeah. Speaking of ridiculous head movies, I strongly suggest doing 1957's *The Man Without a Body*, which has a plot, which has a plot so WTF that I'm shocked it's never shown up on MST3K. Hmm. Hmm. Man Hmm. without a body. I don't know. Put that that on the list. Yeah. It is. Never heard of it. Oh darn. Thanks, Daphne. Thanks. <laughs> well, you, you had to get broken in sometime, right. Daphne, and this is just, thanks, this is thanks, Daphne, thanks. <laughs> All righty, um, we know Gregory's kids, but he, but he doesn't. I I had fun with it. All right, so appreciate the comments from uh, Ralph, Mikey, Gregory Crosby, and CWD Kidman two two six six. We appreciate that and we everybody please make comments tell us stuff about the movie you liked or that we missed or that maybe we got wrong or that you would have liked to have heard us say uh, plenty of ways to stay in touch with us or give us recommendations you can send the feedback to feedback at gruesomemagazine.com you can leave comments on gruesome magazine's youtube channel or in the uh, gruesome magazine's hnr and doh podcast facebook group or on the website gruesomemagazine.com Please do. So that's it for this episode. But every two weeks, we'll be focusing on a specific film released between 1920 and 1969. Next up is one chosen by Chad. Fiend Without a Face from 1958. Ooh. Brains getting blowed up real good. Different from Head Without a Body. Fiend Without a Face. Okay. I dig it. (laughs) And we, we may have a special guest for that if things work out right. So, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to this one. This is this one, this one is a this one. This movie should be much bigger than it is. It's yeah. such a great movie. It's such a great movie. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. All righty. Great uh, effects. Yes. Well, guys, <laughs> folks, everybody, uh, catch us again here in two weeks. For another great horror movie of the classic era, as only decades of horror can do it. Thanks so much, uh, Doc and Chad, for sticking with the many changes on the schedule. And uh, we'll get this out on time. It will still come out on time. It's what we do here. Say good night. Good night. Say good night again. Good night again. Good night again. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>